Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 9th of December of 2020. And the article that I'm going to be using as a citation for today's podcast was published just a couple days ago on the 30th of November in the publication Academic Emergency Medicine. The title of the article is Nasal High Flow Oxygen versus Conventional Oxygen Therapy. And what they meant here was either a nasal cannula or a non rebreather for acute severe asthma patients, a pilot randomized controlled trial. And I really have to tip my hat off to the authors of this pilot study because I think they did a pretty good job within their construct. And as always, this is not medical advice on how to take care of your patients. And I ultimately recommend that you read this article for yourself as the links to the article are in the show notes. So let's go ahead. Those of us who are listening to this podcast have a general idea as to what the standard of care is for adults who come in to the emergency department with acute asthma exacerbations. They all receive supplemental oxygen to keep the SADs above 92% on the pulse ox. They get bronchodilators, anticholinergics, your choice of steroids, and possibly some bonus magnesium depending on how you were trained. In addition to this, we obtain a series of labs, chest x-ray, etc., and in some cases, an arterial blood gas. You know, we get really, really scared when these patients who are really sick have findings of both hypoxemia as well as hypercapnia on their ABG. Because at the end of the day, the hypercapnia is because they're tiring out. And so you gotta, you gotta worry about impending respiratory failure on these patients. It's obviously very concerning for the treating clinician as well as the staff. Obviously, let's, let's not forget that the patient is also suffering because they can't ventilate. They start becoming a little bit more somnolent. Yeah, bad things happen. But I'm not going to belabor with this particular podcast what asthma is, and I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty of the pathophysiology because that's beyond the scope of this podcast. But a good chunk of these patients are going to need some adjunctive oxygen therapy to try to keep their SATs at or above 92% on their pulse ox. And so when they reach for, when the clinician, excuse me, or respiratory therapists are, who are the ones who more aptly respond to these patients, see the patient, they go ahead and they place them on supplemental oxygen, whether it's nasal cannula, of any mask, or a non-rebreather. The other inclination is for, for us to go ahead and reach for non-invasive ventilation, which many of us call BiPAP, which is used as a rescue modality before having to intubate these people. It's pretty crazy to believe, but the data of using non-invasive ventilation is not very robust, but I'll get to more of that in a second or in a subsequent podcast. Many of us have been using the high-flow nasal cannula system for a number of different pathologies. I'm going to get more into that in a moment. But there's actually no data, at least that I've been able to find at this time, about using the high-flow nasal cannula system in patients who have severe asthma exacerbation. Reasons why it could benefit include the fact that it provides 100% FiO2 and it could also provide up to 60 liters of flow. In addition to that, the high-flow nasal cannula system provides both heated and humidified air, as well as decreases dead space ventilation, amongst other, other things that I'm not going to get into at this time. But those of us who are familiar with the system have been able to keep many people off of mechanical ventilation by using this, this technology, which is, at the end of the day, very comfortable for the patient because it's not obtrusive over the patient's mouth. They can still talk to you. They can still eat. They can still you know, speak to their family members. And I personally use it every single day with my patients. There are many known and extensively studied benefits to using the high-flow nasal cannula system in a multitude of different pathologies. You know, from ARDS, pneumonia, there is some data for COPD exacerbations, but the reality is that there isn't much with regards to asthma. Obviously, since it's a pilot study, they haven't worked out all the kinks. That's the purpose of doing this pilot study. And so before you go ahead and interpret the data, you have to be aware that there are glaring limitations that, that you kind of have to forgive it at this point because they're supposed to work out the kinks later on. You know, there's some things that are noted here. For example, you cannot blind people. I mean, <laughs> come on, you can see the high flow nasal cannula system on the patient's face. You can't blind the patients. You can't blind the researchers. You can't blind the staff. But at least they did go ahead and randomize the patients. And, and again, the group of patients was pretty small. It was only 37 patients. Um, 19 received the high-flow nasal cannula system, where 18 received the conventional oxygen therapy, which, what I mentioned before, was either a standard nasal cannula system or a non-rebreather for 120 minutes. People ask, what 
settings where they set up on, on the high flow nasal cannula system. And they were started off on a flow of 35 liters, and this was titrated between 30 to 60 liters, depending on the patient. The same thing with the FiO2. It was titrated to a certain target. But that's enough about me. Let's evaluate this pilot study on high flow in asthma. And the first thing I need to point out for you all is that this is a pilot study out of Thailand where they provided high flow nasal cannula systems to patients who had severe asthma exacerbations. Now, I know a lot, of you, a lot of you folks who are my audience are learning about different statistical methodologies, different types of trials, etc. And so I want to introduce you to what a pilot study is because many people have heard this word before, but they don't really know what it is. So if you know what it is, you know, just, just bear with me because I'm going to get through this pretty quickly. But a pilot study is defined as, quote, a small scale test of the methods and procedures to be used on a larger scale. Basically, what they're doing here is they're seeing if it's feasible to go ahead and conduct this particular study. Because again, the purpose of a pilot study is to, quote, evaluate the feasibility of recruitment, randomization, retention, assessment procedures, new methods, and implementation of the novel intervention, end quote. And of course, using the high flow nasal cannula system is the implementation of a novel intervention in this particular patient population. Those of us who have cared for these patients know we want to do everything we possibly can do to keep these patients off the ventilator, but obviously we have to do it safely because we know that delaying intubation in these patients could lead to worse outcomes. So now let's look at the outcomes. And as a primary outcome, they use this thing called the modified Borg score. And what the modified Borg score is, is a way for the patients to rate their degree of dyspnea by a measurement, of course, called the modified Borg score. And all in all, just to get the results out of the way, the authors found that at 120 minutes, the patients who are in the high flow nasal cannula arm had less dyspnea due to their asthma exacerbation than the patients in the conventional oxygen therapy group. Now, as a secondary outcome, they use a different type of dyspnea scale called the numerical rating scale of dyspnea, which is similar to the Borg score, but in reality, the authors wanted another method of obtaining validity to the results. And the long story short is that the patients in the high flow nasal cannula group also did better with this scale at 120 minutes. Now, to wrap up this podcast, you know, now we can't say that there's no data whatsoever looking at using high flow nasal cannula systems for acute asthma exacerbations. We know we have this. But at the same time, we need to acknowledge that by no means is this data any type of robust. You know, but at least we know that it doesn't cause any harm. And there's much, much nuance to this article that I can't cover here in the sake of the podcast because it, it would honestly bore you to death. But in the description box of this podcast, in the show notes, you will be able to find links to the article. Unfortunately, this is not a free article, but when there's a will, there's a way. You can go ahead and try to find the article for yourself. In my practice, I, I can I could say that to this day, I, I've never used a high-flow nasal cannula system in patients who have acute asthma exacerbations, but I'm definitely going to consider it moving forward. Again, I have to be very thankful that I do not see many asthma exacerbations in my ICU, and this likely a tribute to the great job that my emergency medicine colleagues and the staff do in the emergency department. As always, when it comes to this particular podcast and other part other podcasts I've done before, you know, always try to read the articles that I cite for yourself and don't trust me. As a disclosure, I always have to mention that I am a consultant for a company that makes high flow nasal cannula devices, but they're not compensating me for this podcast. So this is just my take on this article. I'm excited about future studies coming out with regards to this therapy because ultimately at the end of the day, I believe in the therapy and I have no qualms whatsoever using it in my patients routinely. Thanks so much for your support. Hope you all have a great day. Take care.